Okay. Uh, je suis Leo Panic. Uh, I'm sorry for not having the courage to subject you to my appalling French, French accent. Uh, let me congratulate the organizers. Uh, it is wonderful to see the way the Université Populaire has been shifted to this much more strategic and I think dynamic orientation. Uh, and, and I really congratulate you for uh, taking this initiative. Uh, last night, the conference began with a tribute to Rosa Luxemburg, who was, of course, murdered uh, in 1919. And that was very appropriate. But it's also very appropriate for a conference like this in 2019 uh, to commemorate the centenary of the great Canadian workers' revolt in 1919. Most famously, of course, uh, it is uh, remembered in terms of the Winnipeg General Strike, the six weeks long strike in the city in which I was born, uh, which ended with the mounted police uh, which ended with the mounted police uh, murdering two workers uh, and mercilessly beating in the alleyways of downtown Winnipeg hundreds of others. Uh, that was instigated by uh, a citizens committee of 1,000 uh, businessmen uh, who called the federal government in and uh, that repression in. What is not so well known is that many of those figures uh, themselves, and certainly uh, the sons of many of them, uh, were, first came to Western Canada to suppress the Riel Rebellion. The same people. But it's often thought that 1919 was about the Winnipeg workers. It wasn't. It was a revolt right across Canada, and not least here in Quebec, which is often forgotten. In fact, the Great Workers' Revolt of 1919 really begins in Montreal in December 1918 with the strike of the firemen, the strike of the municipal workers in general, and the organization of the police into a union, refusing to suppress the other workers. Uh, uh, they were successful, very largely, and that gave a lot of courage to the 68 strikes that took place in this city in 1919 alone, most of them successful. By June 1919, when the Winnipeg strike occurred, in conjunction with the struggle of the shipyard workers at the Vickers uh, shipyard uh, factory, the metal workers, the boiler makers, etc. Uh, there was a much larger sympathy strike, both with them and with the Winnipeg General Strike, which only was brought to a close by the violent suppression of the Winnipeg Strike uh, a week later, in, in, in uh, around June 21st, uh, uh, in Winnipeg. Now, I say all this uh, for various reasons before entering into a discussion of the international situation for the left today. Um, I say this because uh, it's important to remember uh, that that remarkable year of worker revolt was one which brought together an enormous, diverse range of working people, especially people who had recently been brought to Canada as immigrants and were subject to the most appalling racism. Uh, whether they were from Greece or from Italy, as many of them were, whether they were from Eastern Europe as Jews or Ukrainians or Poles, uh, they were treated as aliens insofar as they engaged in militant activity. Uh, they were often subject to deportation, and many of them were deported uh, in this context. And it's crucially important to remember the extent to which Working people were able to overcome the attempted divisions amongst them in that year of revolt, recognizing each other as workers despite the differences amongst them. Similarly, 
1919, a waitresses' union was formed in Montreal. The Montreal Trades and Labor Council refused to recognize them. They thought that women should be back in the home after the war. Right? Nevertheless, a great many workers supported them, and they supported the struggles and the sympathy strikes through that year. What does this mean for us today? At the end of World War I, many people thought that capitalism could not sustain itself. The demands that those workers were making for an eight-hour day, for the right to organize and to strike being established in law, was often mixed up in their discourse, in their consciousness, with a notion that capitalism could not deliver that. And that is why, even though they were often making reformist demands, they often put these demands in terms of socialist demands. Many of them were highly influenced by Marxism and the Socialist Party of Canada, the Social Democratic Party of Canada, was often rendered illegal, including here in Quebec, in those periods. What had happened in World War I was that the first internationalization of capital, which went on from the late 19th century through the first decade of the 20th century, entered into contradictions with the old structures of the old imperial European states. And that, of course, produced the inter-imperial rivalry that led to World War I. It looked to many people uh, that capitalism would be unable to sustain itself. It couldn't be reproduced. And for those who lived to see the Depression and World War II, they were all the more convinced that was the case. After World War II, a new globalization was established under the aegis of an informal American empire, very dissimilar from a state from the old European empires. During the 30 glorious years of compromise with the working classes and their political and union representatives, uh, when the reforms that were struggled for in 1919 were to some extent won, although always at a cost, we won the right to strike, but we lost the right to take part in sympathy strikes. The very essence of what went on in 1919. It was illegal to go out in support of another group of workers on strike under the very legislation that gave us the right to strike. Yes. But the main dynamic of those years was not the class compromise, was not the welfare state, the main dynamic, even of the post-war years, was the bringing of financial capital, which had collapsed in the 1930s, back to health. The bringing of multinational corporations into the world as investment vehicles, accumulation vehicles, around in every facet of human life around the world. That dynamic was already going on through the 1950s and 1960s, and it grew to such an extent that by the 1970s, it exploded the old reforms. The reforms couldn't contain this dynamic capitalism. And even unions with the right to strike couldn't contain the multinational corporations. With the defeat of trade unionism, in the 1980s, everywhere around the world, you had an untrammeled globalization which departed from the inflation crisis of the 1970s, which unleashed the financialization that Audrey was talking about at an entirely new level, and which appeared to integrate the world's capitalist states in a way that even Kautsky could not have imagined in World War I. He was the one who predicted, as against Lenin, that there would be a condominium of ruling classes after World War I, which might stabilize capitalism. He couldn't have imagined the degree of integration that occurred amongst the world states in that period. It was done through free trade agreements. It was done through the type of uh, defenses of intellectual property regimes and in property regimes in general that those, those treaties and other treaties uh, oversaw. It was done above all, however, 
through the interpenetration through investment uh, and the global value chains that were created in every nation state in the world. It was already said by Raymond Aron, the, the French sociologist in the 1960s, that Europe was being Canadianized. What he meant by that was that the penetration of American multinational capital was establishing American capital as a social force inside Europe. And he saw that as what had happened to Canada as it moved from being a British colony to an informal American colony, which is what we are. Uh, but that didn't stop with Europe. And even China, the greatest late capitalist developer in world history, is also the greatest accumulator on the basis of foreign direct investment. That late development has taken place in conjunction with the investment of multinational corporations. Less so multinational banks, but that's precisely what the pressure on China is all about. Opening up their capital markets to investment by the uh, uh, international finance and integrating the value chains in production that now link China to global capitalism with the value chains of international finance. Of course, this system is extremely volatile. A financialized capitalism is an inherently volatile one. And as one country after another through the 1980s and especially in the 1990s removed its exchange controls and its capital controls, you had no less than 72 financial crises in the course of the 1990s around the world. Some of them were very contagious. The Mexican peso crisis, especially the Asian crisis of 1997, 98. They were contained largely at the, under the umbrella of the American Treasury and Federal Reserve working in close conjunction with other central banks and other finance ministries. And of course, uh, aided by the IMF and to some extent the World Bank, the international financial institutions. The Treasury under Clinton issued a very uh, serious and long report after the, uh, after the peso crisis in Mexico in 94. They were required to do a report on what they were doing about crises. And the central message of that report was that we can no longer prevent crises. Capitalism is too dynamic, the world economy, they said, is too dynamic. It requires so many new financial commodities and instruments in order to be able to facilitate the value chains around the world right, that we can't possibly attempt to regulate these. Our main task now is not crisis prevention, it's crisis containment. And in the Treasury, the most common term used for what they did was fire prevention. We are the firefighters. Well, when the 2007-2008 crisis emerged, in the heart of the empire itself, in the American mortgage market, which was guaranteed by the state and had all of the world's financial institutions, including pension funds from around the world, investing in poor people's housing inside the United States. Most of black Cleveland's uh, mortgages were held by the Deutsche Bank. It was a crisis in the United States, but it was one in which global capital was invested. And when that crisis happened, it certainly appeared that it would be very difficult to contain, and it was very difficult to contain. But now as we stand here looking back a decade later, it is remarkable the way in which the world's capitalist states came together to contain that crisis and prevent it from becoming, except in the case of Greece, a, another Great Depression. Uh, still under Bush, the leaders of the G20 were called together, originally the G20 
was a finance minister's uh, coordinating conference. He brought the leaders together in October to Washington, and they issued a statement saying, we will not go back to what happened in the, 19, in the interwar period. Uh, we commit ourselves to free capital movements, to free trade, and they have retained that commitment. Most of us who went and demonstrated as, as part of the anti-globalization protests at the G7 or G20 meetings don't know that every communique, which was always written beforehand by the American Treasury, reproduced that commitment not to reintroduce tariffs, not to reintroduce capital controls. That's what they were doing at this. Most impressively, in terms of reproducing capitalism, was exactly 10 years ago. Exactly 10 years ago. Exactly in this month. The G20 came together and coordinated a global fiscal stimulus. In the Chinese case, and in the American case, the largest fiscal stimulus in it, world history. Even the Germans, who are most reluctant, we all know, to engage in any fiscal stimulus, bought on it for that year. And it was that that turned that crisis from heading directly, as it was doing, into a Great Depression, into what became known as the Great Recession. Where do we stand today? That crisis after 10 years, and it took 10 years, until synchronized growth was restored to the capitalist world. Even Greece today has a respectable rate of growth. The rates of growth have not returned to anything like they were in the Trente Glorieuse, nothing like that. Nevertheless, sustained growth has, was established in the United States by 2012. Uh, and although that immediately was followed by the Eurozone crisis, right, and then by the commodity crisis in the third world, by 2018 you had synchronized growth almost everywhere. It was low growth growth. Profits re recovered immensely. Right? Indeed, uh, to such an extent that while investment didn't recover, uh, there was loads of cash uh, to be going into the, financial, the reproduction of the financialization that Audrey was talking about. The crisis has now morphed itself into a political crisis of global capitalism. And it's a very profound one. What has happened in the course of the way the 2008 crisis worked itself out is that the contradictions of globalization have taken the form of the resurgence of xenophobic nationalisms. There was always a strain of discomfort amongst right-wing politicians, nationalist politicians, but also working classes and even the left with the effects of globalization in terms not only of the movements of capital, but also of the movements of labor. The very chaos of global capitalism right, produced insecurities, even in its greatest successes. One needs to remember that Clinton, in the run-up to getting elected in 1992, was not in favor of NAFTA. The country where it was hardest to get NAFTA passed was the United States, not Canada or Mexico. And in every instance, as with social democratic parties uh, around the world as well, uh, uh, the uh, Democratic Party in the United States uh, carried through a globalization project with greater enthusiasm uh, than did even the Republican parties. Insofar as after the crisis, Social Democracy and the Obama-led Democratic Party went back to fostering globalization and financialization. This finally led to the loss of a significant portion of their working class base. In the United States, working class communities 
which had unfailingly voted Democrat every election since the 1930s, and voted for Obama in 2008 and 2012, suddenly turned to vote for this political shyster, uh, Donald Trump. And did so because he alone was speaking in terms of the working class, its insecurities. And of course, overlaying that with the mendacious, xenophobic, anti-immigrant, racist appeal. And the Democrats, as social democracy in Europe, were largely naked in the face of this. Not because they weren't liberals. Not because they themselves were uh, inherently racist. Precisely because they had abandoned that class base in promoting globalization. The story is well known from one country to another. And it's seen most startlingly, if we go back to what happened after World War I, in the fact that the German and Swedish social democratic parties, the Austrian social democratic party, the great, the great mass working class parties that came out of the formation of working classes from 1880 to 1920, right, are now running at something like 20% or less of the vote. It's an astonishing deformation, politically, a very historically significant one, and tragically it has a lot to do with class deformation. It has to do with, uh, just as classes are formed over time, so are they deconstructed over time. Especially insofar as that political parties play a role in forming classes, so have they historically undermined class formation. The xenophobic nationalisms are a symptom of the contradictions of capitalist globalization. One should not think for a minute they are restricted to Europe and uh, uh, Canada and, and, and uh, the United States. They are not. What just happened this week with the re-election of uh, a militant Hindu party uh, whose militia movement looks more like a fascist organization than any of the other right-wing parties that are being elected today, is an indication of the extent to which we find the xenophobic nationalism going on in the third world, not least in the BRICS, which so many people were excited about on the left as providing an alternative. The linkages between Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, South Africa. Nor should one think that Chinese capitalism, that strange communist-led, uh, venal uh, Chinese capitalism, is not nationalist. It is. It is. So this is a global phenomenon, and one of the paradoxes of globalization, which has required the nation-state to sustain it, to promote it. It's not corporations that sign free trade agreements. It states that signed free trade agreements. One of the paradoxes of globalization always was that th those in the state who saw it through always made the case that we're doing this in the national interest. And when it turned out in the wake of the 2008 crisis that it was so obviously harmful to so many people in each of their countries, it provided the basis for these political shysters, for these political scoundrels, right, to make an anti-globalization appeal by appealing to nationalism. You see, globalization was not in the national interest. In fact, none of these parties have an agenda of deconstructing globalization, not least uh, because their bourgeoisies are too deeply integrated into the reproduction of global capitalism, into the value chains involved. Uh, that said, the crisis, the political crisis we're living through, is extremely serious for global capitalism, precisely because the institutions that are so necessary to contain its crises are being undermined. 
The real effect of Trump is not the tariffs. It just came out on the Financial Times front page yesterday that Tyson, the largest beef producer in the world, the United States is the larger ex exporter of beef in the whole world, but Tyson has just announced a massive investment in Kazakhstan so it can produce beef in Kazakhstan to import into China and in that way avoid the tariffs. And this is, of course, what happens with foreign direct investment. This is how American capital jumped over the tariffs that were created in Canada as part of the national policy by McDonald in the 1880s. Right? The Singer sewing machine started investing in Quebec and in Ontario right? uh, in order to be able to sell to uh, Canadian farmers and Canadian workers their sewing machines, producing them here rather than importing them to avoid the tariff, and the same thing will occur with these tariffs. The real danger for reproducing global capitalism is that the institutions, the Treasury, the Fed, the linkages between the central banks and, and, and the finance ministries are atrophying. The Treasury no longer writes the communiques for the G20. On the contrary, they come to those meetings and find that they're in chaos there. Here, uh, it, at the Quebec G20 meeting, you, or G, which was the G7 meeting just before the G21, you saw Angela Merkel standing over Trump, surrounded by all the other leaders and, and their, their technocrats. Right? And she's leaning over Trump, he's sitting there very happy, and she says, having induced us into this global arrangement, you're now walking out on it without consulting us? This political crisis of globalization is a real one, it's a severe one, and you see it even in, especially in, that state apparatus which is closest to a multinational state apparatus, the European Union. Where does the left find itself in this political crisis of globalization? It was never the case that neoliberal globalization was a fully hegemonic ideology. Perry Anderson once said neoliberalism was the most successful ideology in world history. He said that in about 2000, just at the time of Seattle. He was wrong. Uh, those of you, many of you, some of you here who were involved in organizing the World Social Forums, especially Pierre Baudet, uh, will find such a statement ludicrous. Uh, not only Seattle, but Porto Alegre and all of the uh, world social movement uh, uh, conferences uh, showed the extent to which neoliberal globalization was never fully hegemonic. What was the case was that there was no political outlet other than protest for the expression of that anti-globalization sentiment. Uh, there was a quasi-anarchist, a quasi-syndicalist moment, as had been the case in the late 19th century, where, uh, as you heard from some of the uh, activists most as, uh, associated with the Zapatistas, uh, the ide ideology of the left was uh, uh, take, changing the world without taking power. Uh, we will protest outside of the state, but we don't need to get into the state to change it. And that reached its apogee, of course, with Occupy. Uh, in the wake of the 2008 crisis. And what was especially interesting about Occupy, which linked up with the indignados in Europe, with Syntagma in Europe, etc., was the extent to which that anti-globalization protest increasingly became class-focused. The class map was crude, 99 to 1, is a very crude class map, but at least it was class-focused. It was focused around the inequality that globalization is creating in class terms, thereby encompassing the diversity of all of those who are being harmed by it. What happened since, and this is very important in terms of the conjuncture we're in, is that there was a very short bridge from the Occupy protests, from the Indignados, from Sigtagma, etc., from the G20, great G20 protest in Toronto, a very short bridge to a movement towards politics again. A movement from protest to politics, which you saw here in Quebec, in the result that QS secured in the last election, in the wake of uh, 
the mobilization and enthusiasm of the student strikes. We now are in a situation with Podemos, with the disappointments of Syriza, but with the continued dynamic of Sanders, above all the DSA in the United States, and especially, who would believe it, with Corbyn in Britain. Astonishing that socialism has come to be on the agenda again, the reconstruction of the capitalist state into a socialist one in the Anglo-Saxon world. Above all, in the hearts of financial capital, the city of London and Wall Street. Yes? I'm out of time, so I need to conclude. The interface between the contradictions of globalization being expressed politically in terms of xenophobic nationalisms and the shift of the left from protest to politics is seen in all of its complexity in Britain and to some extent the United States, but especially in Britain with Brexit. And there is a great danger that the attempt to define British politics once again in terms of class struggle, in terms of, as the Labour Manifesto put it, a struggle by the many against the few, is being sidelined, all the air is being taken out of it, by a largely asocial commitment to internationalization against xenophobic nationalism. Understandably. Europe looks good. Yes, the German-dominated, neoliberal, right. uh, uh, cruel in the case of Greece and to some extent Spain and Portugal as well. Right. European Union right, is seen as a paragon of virtue by virtue of the European Court of Justice, by virtue of the labor legislation, by virtue of human rights legislation is seen a paragon of internationalism in the wake of a Boris Johnson-led xenophobia. And what gets driven out of the debate has been the attempt by Jeremy Corbyn to say, no, we need to combine both those who voted for Remain and those who voted for Leave on a common platform of a democratic socialist strategy. And that involves a very close relationship with Europe, he says, whether we're in or whether we're, we're out. That increasingly is not being heard as political discourse is dividing between, yes, we're on the left, we're liberal, we must be internationalist. Above all, we have to be against xenophobia, and that's right. right? And that all the more entrenched old imperial British xenophobia and nationalism. So it's not at all clear that, as was the case with Syriza, and as will be the case uh, should Saunders get elected president of the United States, that this thrust of, from protest to politics will go very far. In any case, I'll end with this, we have to curb our enthusiasms. We have to recognize that given the defeat of class forces from below that have been so badly suffered over the last 40 years, almost everywhere, that what we're engaged in as we try to link up what was so positive about the protest movements, what is so positive about the anti-racist diversity focus of the social movements, with a recognition that we can protest forever outside the state and we'll never change the world. Until hell freezes over, we can protest, unless we get into the political system and use it and transform it. We have to figure out how to bring those things together. That is not a short-term political project.
The fact that QS is at 17% of the vote is a good thing, not a bad thing. The problem for Corbyn is that he might end up prime minister out of this mess in the next few months, and the Labour Party is, as was the case with Syriza, is not at all prepared to go into the state and not be social democratized again. Momentum is not prepared for this at all. The 50,000 young people who have joined it are not prepared for this at all. Uh, and, and this will take time. And that applies, I think, to all of the exciting developments that are on, on, on uh, uh, the verge, I think, of transforming the politics of the 21st century. Uh, uh, we need time. Thank you.